Um, a very different Tuesday. I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, 12 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate the following letter has been received from Senator O'Neill. Pursuant to Standing Order 75, I propose the following matter of public importance be submitted to the Senate for discussion. The Prime Minister's failure to deliver a speedy, effective rollout of COVID-19 vaccines, meaning Australians remain dangerously exposed to the highly infectious Delta variant with the lowest vaccination rate in the developed world. I um, is the proposal supported? It is. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers for today's discussion. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. And I call Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, Australians are paying the price for Mr. Morrison's complacency. And today, as we meet here in the Senate, millions of, of Australians, those in New South Wales, in Queensland, are in lockdown. And there are two reasons why. Mr Morrison failed to listen to warnings to establish safe, fit-for-purpose national quarantine, just like he failed to listen to bushfire warnings two years ago. And the other reason is he completely failed to deliver a plan to get us out of the pandemic. Whilst governments around the world raced to secure supplies of vaccines to inoculate their populations, Mr Morrison's government had a wait-and-see approach. Reports from industry publication by Pharma Dispatch have indicated that last year it was an open secret in the pharmaceutical industry that there was exasperation over the government's lack of urgency, the Morrison government's lack of urgency in securing vaccine supplies for Australians. They reported that whilst other countries to do, rushed to do deals, the industry was constantly told that the Morrison government is not ready to procure or engage in discussions about procuring the vaccine. Can you believe that? Other countries are off doing deals, and our government is telling the pharmaceutical industry constantly end quote, that they are not ready to procure or engage in discussions about procuring the vaccine. It was, it was a wait-and-see approach, a wait-and-see approach, business as usual. I mean, even under President Trump, the American vaccine was called Operation Warp Speed. Well, no Operation Warp Speed for this Prime Minister. He preferred wait-and-see, because remember, it's not a race. It's not a race. It's not a race. Of course, he only said it's not a race as an excuse for his, the growing de delays in his vaccine rollout. And he needed that excuse. He needed that excuse because, la because last year he said Australia would be at the front of the international queue. Do you remember that? I promise Australians they'll be at the front of the queue. We're at the front of the queue. And when he said to Australians that we were at the front of the queue, he knew that other countries, many other countries, had ordered their vaccines months ahead of us. Months ahead of us. He said Australians would be at the front of the queue, even though he only got around to ordering Pfizer in November, months later, months after other countries had ordered theirs, and then he only ordered enough for five million Australians. This Prime Minister, Mr Morrison, has made so many excuses, but all roads lead back to him. He put all his eggs in one basket, the AstraZeneca basket, and he did that despite it being well established that best practice is to have a range of options. And really, it's more than that, isn't it? It's common sense. Mr Bowen, who was then the Shadow Health Minister, was saying in the middle of last year that world's best practice was to have four to six vaccine deals. But as per normal, Mr Morrison was too arrogant to listen, always exist insisting he knows best. Too arrogant to listen, always insisting he knows best. And when it became clear to everyone he had once again dropped the ball and failed to deliver, he said, oh, no, but it's not a race. It's not a competition. But Australians know, and Australians knew, it's always been a race to beat this virus. Because until we have Australians vaccinated, lives, jobs, the economy and the recovery are at risk. And while Australians ran the ever greater risk of infection with COVID-19, the government's response to that risk was infected by the problem, Mr Morrison's complacency. Now lockdowns are being made necessary by his failures, and they are costing the economy around $300 million a day. And this is the price that small business and working Australians are paying for Mr Morrison's incompetence. 
and his competence hasn't been limited to the vaccine rollout and to quarantine. He's pressured premiers not to go into lockdown when clearly they needed to. As recently as June, Mr Morrison publicly pressured the Premier of New South Wales not to go into lockdown at the start of this outbreak, even though at the time he said this, there was already ample evidence from around the world of the dangers of the Delta variant, which was also the reason for the outbreak, the driver of the outbreak in New South Wales. And remember what he said. I commend the Premier of New South Wales. I commend the New South Wales Premier for the fact that she hasn't gone to lock down Australia's biggest city. Then yesterday he said, oh, the only way to get on top of these things and ensure, ensure you don't have longer lockdowns is to move quickly. As always with Mr Morrison, his story changes from week to week. You can't rely on him. He just blows with the political wind. He was dead against locking down Bondi and now the rest of Sydney and beyond are playing the price. Now we know there are chronic supplies of the supply of vaccines under this government. But there is more we can do to encourage all Australians to sign up to get vaccinated. And today, continuing his approach of offering constructive solutions to the COVID crisis, Mr Albanese put forward another positive proposal, a $300 one-off payment for all Australians to, who are fully vaccinated by December 1st. And it's a good idea, not just because it provides an incentive to get vaccinated, but it also delivers a critical shot in the arm for businesses and workers who are struggling from ongoing lockdowns—$300 million a day. A simple, practical idea that can make a big difference. And you know what? We actually know this government's already been considering what incentives they can offer. You know, this was indicated in their own COVID response plan when their chief medical officer has said, and I'll quote, we really do need to look for I've lost the page. So we really do need to look for incentives. This is from Mr. Mr. Kelly. We really do need to look for incentives, as many incentives as we can, for people to become vaccinated. There was obviously a little footnote. Unless Anthony Albanese supports it, unless he proposes it. So the medical advice is we really do need to look for incentives, as many incentives as we can, for people to become vaccinated. And that's based on the simple reality of how hard it is to get that last surge of vaccines that we will need if we are to avoid or minimise the risk of future lockdowns. And we know from the government's own backgrounding of the media, they were considering giving people frequent flyer points and discount vouchers. So you'd think they'd have little to quibble about with Mr Albanese's proposal. And yet, just as he dismissed arrogantly Labor's proposal for wage subsidies before he finally introduced JobKeeper, and just as he arrogantly dismissed Labor's call for more vaccine deals, which he clearly should have done, Mr Morrison has arrogantly dismissed this idea today. You see, with this bloke, it's always politics first. He's much more interested in scoring political points than doing the right thing. See, the core proposition he seems to be putting forward is financial incentives don't work. That's big news to everybody here and big news to anyone who has ever had a job. It's an extraordinary and a bizarre claim. And it is so because what he says changes depending on his political circumstances. Because can anyone imagine the leader of the party that claims to be about enterprise saying that financial reward is bad? You see, people understand incentives do work. Mr Morrison knows incentives work. And there are two possible explanations for him being so arrogantly dismissive of the idea to give financial incentives for Australians to be all vaccinated by December the 1st. Is it just that they're so stubborn about playing politics that if Mr Albanese says it, they dismiss it? Or is it they don't have enough vaccine supply to get Australians fully vaccinated by December the 1st? Today, Mr Morrison claimed he wasn't going to offer financial reward. He said that's not the Australian way. Well, this bloke is in no place to define the Australian way. Because I tell you what, most Australians think our way is to be straight with people, to own up to your mistakes, to put the country's interests ahead of your own personal political interests. So just for once, just for once, could Mr Morrison put politics aside? Because yet again, what we see, he is still more interested in his short-term political interests than the national interests, more interested in scoring political points than helping people, 
more interested in making excuses for his own failures than winning for Australia. And the result is nearly half our country in lockdown. And the result is that in the race to be vaccinated against this deadly virus, Australia is last in the developed world. Uh, thank you. Senator Hughes. Mr Acting Deputy President, well, I mean, those opposite, you guys like seriously must be hating on the Olympics. You must be hating the fact that we're doing so well and that Australians are being represented by these fantastic athletes that are continuing to do our country proud, because there is seriously nothing you guys can't knock down, discredit and quite plainly misrepresent when it comes to our great nation. I mean, this persistent cry. I mean, why do you hate Australia? Seriously, this persistent cry from those opposite about the vaccine rollout, all whilst out there contributing, contributing and aiding and abetting and pushing Order, it along. Sir. Vaccine Order. hesitancy, confusion, Order. misinformation, Order. continuing to spread Order. that. You guys need to have a really, really good hard look at yourselves and start to get on board with Team Australia. Because quite frankly, you're left. just making it up. Making it up. And you know, this claim that we're at the bottom, the world ranking when it comes to the vaccination rate is actually wrong. But I mean, I understand for those of you opposite that maths isn't exactly your strong suit. So perhaps that lesson when they taught you how to read graphs, you might have been absent or chatting away or looking at what the big government and the unions were supposed to tell you to do and what you needed to think. Because when you see countries like New Zealand underneath our vaccination rate, that means that Australia's not at the bottom. But perhaps it's this inability to read graphs and interpret data is why you guys are unable to recognise a really important graph, a really important graph that continues to show Australia at the bottom, but in this instance, it's in the, at, at the bottom of rates of death by COVID. Now, I would have thought that was a pretty good graph to be at the bottom of, but I'm not sure you guys have even seen it, let alone can understand it. But can you imagine had we not had the failure of the Andrews government last year? where he absolutely was culpable for multiple and hundreds, hundreds of deaths. Imagine without his failed effort where we would be. I mean, just unbelievable success when it comes to COVID death rates across Australia. But of course, you guys aren't interested in any of that, aren't interested in any of the economic success, aren't interested in any of the lives and livelihoods that were saved. For you, there's never been a scare campaign you don't like. But back to the vaccine rollout, the ALP, if they have any integrity, but I guess I need to spell that word for you, you need to stop this disgraceful misinformation campaign around AstraZeneca. If it wasn't so serious, it would be entertaining. I mean, the member for Maribyrnong, the member for Maribyrnong, order, a man please. whose leadership order aspirations remain strong, remain strong. The order beating of the drum left, for Senator Albanese, the beating Senator of the drum. Senator please. But as order. the member for Maribyrnong proudly tweeted a photo of his second AZ shot before question time today, showing his support for this effective Australian-made vaccine confirming that the Doherty Institute today has confirmed that, in fact, AstraZeneca is just as effective as Pfizer. So I asked the opposition leader, is it purely in a bid to create a point of difference between you and the member of Maribyrnong that you continue to withhold support for AstraZeneca? Is that why, when you're asked to support this Australian-made vaccine, you avoid responding, you worm and weasel your way around the question? But if this is not bad enough, not irresponsible enough behaviour from the man who apparently aspires to put himself forward as the alternative Prime Minister of, of this fantastic nation. He's not just happy feeding into this vaccine misinformation campaign. 
He's now out there ensuring that the ALP goes to the next election with as many vaccine scaremongers, misinformation merchants and, quite frankly, fantasists as candidates. So we've seen with the pre-selection of Dr Michelle Ananda Raja in the seat of Higgins, the ALP is now confirmed, well, we all knew, we all knew it already, that they are more interested in political point scoring, in driving division and wedges between Australians, scaring vulnerable cohorts. Shame on all of you. But of course, the absolute worst of these scaremongers and spreaders of misinformation is none other than the Queensland Chief Health Officer, now rebuked by pretty much every epidemiologist in the country, in fact, pretty much anyone with a medical degree. So that wouldn't include uh, some of the commentators that we regularly see on the ABC. But, you know, if the Queensland Premier is so wedded to reward this woman, who has com shown complete lack of compassion at every opportunity, who's divided and destroyed families and kept them apart, who's spread misinformation, but's never seen a film star or a footballer she won't give a special exemption for at the first opportunity. Let's just make her governor now. Get her in there. Get her out of the public view. Get her out of giving information to Queenslanders about what vaccine they should get, because she clearly doesn't know what she's talking about, and making ridiculous and, quite frankly, stupid claims. But unlike those opposite, with all of this in mind, the grown-ups are actually here working towards increasing vaccination rates, because we know that's how the country will open back up. And perhaps Senator O'Neill would be better spending her time on her internal pre-selection rather than bothering to spread this pathetic propaganda. But for those that are actually interested in the reality of the vaccine rollout, how many jabs have actually been given to Australians, we know that now more than 12 million jabs have been administered. But we also know now that more than one million jabs are being delivered and administered into the arms of Australians every single week. So we've done 12 million today. We're doing over 1 million per week going forward, but not happy over there. Now, like every country around the world, there has been some bumps along the way because this is unprecedented times. And I know those opposite have perfect hindsight, 2020 vision, and of course, have we all listened to them when they had nothing to say, but of course then have every criticism in the world after, everything would be great. Imagine how good things would be with $387 billion worth of new taxes they wanted to introduce. Thank God they didn't get the opportunity after the last election. But every country around the world experienced a couple of bumps, experienced a, a, the, the vaccine rollouts. The pace picked up as it was rolled out. It was slower at the beginning, and then it continued to exponentially grow. And there were some issues. The PMs acknowledge this. Doesn't hide, doesn't weasel his way around why he won't support AstraZeneca. PMs actually acknowledge that there were some issues at the beginning. And some were well and truly out of our control. I realise you don't acknowledge that. Like, you know, when Victoria had problems, that was the PM's issue, or there was no issue because it was Dan Andrews, but now it's in New South Wales, it's all Gladys's fault, and what's not Gladys's fault, Scott's fault. And, you know, you guys just can't quite get it together. But we've seen these issues resolved. We've seen supply increase. There's actually, you know, an excess supply of AstraZeneca to the point that we're sending it overseas. To the point that the Queensland Chief Health Commissioner decided, to, Chief Health Officer decided she didn't even want them. They've kind of changed that position now. But you know, there's AstraZeneca available. And so now we have seen over four and a half million vaccinations given in July. Now, for those of you that don't understand how the rollout has exponentially increased, the four and a half million vaccines that were delivered in July was more than double than what was delivered in May. So May, and then we have June, and then we have July, for those of you not paying attention in school. And so within those couple of months, we saw an over-doubling of the number of vaccines being delivered from 2.1 million to 4.5 million. So when those opposite like to talk about supply issues, when they're talking about stagnation in the vaccine rollout, aside from the fact they're fundamentally living in the past, 
But let's face it, they always pretty much do cling to those old days. But aside from everything I said earlier and the disgraceful behaviour of your chief health officers in Queensland, when you've got all your little cash for comment epidemiologists popping up on the ABC, half of them without even relevant qualifications. They're not even epidemiologists out there talking down AstraZeneca and then you guys racing out to make sure that they're your candidates. There is no supply issue. You need to stop scaring people about AstraZeneca. There's plenty available. We make it here. Why don't you support Australian jobs? Thank you, Senator Hughes. Uh, we have Senator Seawitz on, on the big screen. Order, please, Senator Seawitz. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Yes, please proceed. I uh, wish to contribute to the, to the debate on the Prime Minister's failure to deliver a speedy, effective rollout of COVID-19 COVID vaccines, meaning Australians remain dangerously exposed today to the highly infectious Delta virus. Uh, variant with the lowest vaccination, vaccination rate in the developed world. As people have called it, this is definitely a stroll out of our vaccine rollout across this country. We were in an excellent position before, just before the rollout occurred. We could be so much further ahead if the government had not squandered our advantage in this stroll out of a vaccination process. Billions have been spent on trying to get this rollout fixed, contract after contract, and yet we are still seeing the lowest vaccination uh, rates in the developed world. The Morrison government's rollout today has been characterised by chaos and incompetence. We've witnessed a rollout that has been plagued by constant supply issues, poor messaging and a lack of transparency. Try to get the information that Australians want, and we can't. We've seen that through the COVID committee time and again. Every step of the way, we have had to beg for data, information and action from this government. Across Australia, people have been left confused, angry and disappointed. The vaccination targets that were released last, last Friday raise even more questions. If we are going to get 80% coverage by March 2022, we need to include children over 12 years. The TGA has already approved the use of, the, of Pfizer in four kids over 12. So why weren't kids over 12 included in the vaccination <laughs> targets? It just, it just boggles my mind that we have not included children over 12 in those targets. The government is aiming for 70% of people aged 16 and over to get vaccinated. But this only equates to 56% of the entire population. The Grant Institute, Institute predicts if we reopen at 50% vaccination coverage, then we will see nearly 900,000 cases of COVID. Our hospitals, our ICU wards will be overwhelmed. We can't afford to play these sorts of politics with people's lives. As the government fails to meet its own targets around vaccinating vulnerable populations, we've also seen vaccine inequity emerging. As of the 1st of August 2021, only 24% of First Nations peoples have received at least one dose of their vaccine. This is unacceptable when every, everybody agrees that First Nations communities are particularly vulnerable and they were supposed to be prioritised. I'd hate to see the situation if, in fact, they weren't prioritised, if this is what the government calls prioritising things. Scientists have been warning us for a long time about the emergence of variants, yet we seemed unprepared when Delta hit us in this country. We still haven't adapted. We don't have fit-for-purpose quarantine facilities or the ability to produce M mRNA vaccines here yet. We need to be doing better. We need to be ensuring that we are in a race, a very fierce race, to ensure that we get 80% of our entire population vaccinated as soon as possible. We have no dates. We have no proper dates, no proper timeline for when the government's new approach and new plan is going to be is going Your to time target has that plan. expired, Senator Seward. 
Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. And, uh, I think the Australian people are now very well aware that Mr Morrison had two critical jobs. Mr Morrison and his government and all the people who were sitting on the Treasury benches had two critical jobs, and that was to deliver both vaccination for Australians and quarantine that didn't leak. And they failed absolutely on both fronts. And today I'm really pleased that we can actually put on record in this place the facts of what the Australian community have been experiencing, suffering, worrying about in the period since we last sat in this parliament, particularly, particularly the people from the great state of New South Wales that I'm so proud to represent here in this parliament. So many, so many in my community, so many across Sydney, locked down, businesses gone, never to come back. A total failure of governing this country because they forgot to do two critical things get the vaccine and sort out quarantine. They failed on both. Today's matter of public importance, though, is a particular focus on the impact of the government's failure, the Prime Minister's failure, to deliver a speedy, effective rollout of COVID 19. And I have to wonder what on earth Mr Morrison was doing in June last year, June 2020, when Pfizer came knocking on the door of Australia and the man who was supposed to be in charge, the man who will be in front of a microphone again tomorrow, delighted by the sound of his own voice, Mr Morrison was probably standing up in front of a microphone back then like he will be again, instead of doing his real job, his day job the job of actually doing the work of government, considering carefully what needs to be undertaken for the people of Australia. Instead of somebody thinking about the future, taking seriously the responsibility of getting vaccinations for a one, -hundred year, uh, a, a, a one in 100 year event, such as this COVID-19 outbreak across the world, What's happening now is wholly attributable to this glorified ad man who, with his team, didn't take note of the advice that he was given. He, he talks about health professionals and follow the health advice, but he didn't take the right advice at the right time, and every single one of us is paying for that now. And the consequence in quite a different reality from the world that Senator Hughes seems to uh, reside in, is people who have had good faith in the Australian government to date have lost that faith, have lost that hope. And they're all over Facebook on the Central Coast, where I wish I could go home to, but I can't because we're in lockdown. And I've had to do 14 days ISO just to come here and do my job, and that's nothing by comparison to the imposition and the suffering that's going on right across Sydney right now. People have lost hope. People are despairing. Mental health crises are on the rise. And it's because of people like Nadine Morris, who wrote today on the Facebook page of the member for Robertson, Lucy Wicks, your assurance, she wrote, doesn't mean much when so many people have booked through the federal system. What a joke. I'm beyond furious. This whole situation is a big, fat joke. How are we so far behind in this country? I'm embarrassed to be Australian right now, still in hard lockdown a year and a half into this pandemic with no end in sight. That's what Australians are thinking about this government and its failures to deliver a speedy, effective rollout of COVID-19 vaccination. What double standards, writes Valerie Dressler. One day they're telling people to get out and book for their vaccine. The next day they cancel your appointment. This sends a really bad message, says Daddy Long. Basically, you don't matter. There's a few people I know who've been cancelled because of this. All of them have said they won't be trying again. And there, in microcosm, is exactly described the chaos, the chaos 
of this government's attempt at a vaccination rollout. Don't buy the vaccines. Don't get in a race to deliver them. Don't tell people the truth about what's going on. Stand in front of a microphone every day and pretend that you're governing the country when you're not really doing your job. And watch the whole thing go to hell in a handbasket. Watch businesses go down the drain. Watch families lose their housing because they can't pay their rent. Watch kids who can't go to school. Watch mental health crises emerging up and down the streets on which we live. That is what is happening because the vaccines were not purchased when they should have been and because there has been such terrible messaging in, this, in the way that this government has gone out to the community. Surely this is not OK, says Julie Redfern. We're being told we're in a government-enforced lockdown until people are vaccinated, but now the government is cancelling our appointments of people booked for vaccination. What a mess. Julie Holman calls it like it is. That's BS, Lucy Wicks MP. I had a booking for my vaccination at Gosford Hospital. I was cancelled today. There's a history of blood clots in my family and I'll be supervising HSC students in Sydney. We're all interconnected. There are people who need Pfizer. They can't take AstraZeneca. And every time the government says, sign up, get ready, get your jab, People are taking the government at their word and finding the whole system is failing them. Failing them. Gemma Hall, I'm so tired of our so-called ministers who don't fight for us at all. Why are we continually sold out as a region? People are sick and tired of not being able to get access to a vaccine that the government keeps saying is available. It's not available. There are a number of GPs, very few, on the Central Coast who are able to deliver it. And the ones who had Pfizer have had it removed. So many people are so anxious about this. And it's because of this constant failure to do the right thing by this government, failure to own up to the problems that they themselves created, failure to give the Australian people an even chance. And how bad is Australia's record internationally? The Grattan Institute uh, has been very, very clear over many years in giving frank and fearless health advice to governments of all persuasions. They do their research and they put their reputation on the line every time they put out a report about health. And this is what Stephen Duckett has said, that the government's vaccine strategy is amongst the worst in the world. There are a lot of people in the Australian community who do not listen to politics. They say it doesn't matter, but they're figuring out it matters. I've read from people who said they're embarrassed about Australia's stance on this because we are, in fact, the worst in the world. The numbers don't lie. Because at the end of last week, Australia had inoculated the third lowest proportion of its population in any OECD nation. We are falling far behind countries like Costa Rica, Mexico, Colombia and almost all of Europe. And we have contributions like that of Senator Hughes, who tries to indicate that Labor politicians like myself, on this side of the chamber, standing up for our communities, holding the government to account, telling it like it really is. And Senator Hughes dares to say that we haven't got pride in this nation. Well, I've got pride in this nation. I've got pride in the people who want to do the right thing. I've got pride in all the people who want to sign up and get their AstraZeneca or their Pfizer. I've got pride in the doctors who are helping them make the decisions about which vaccine is best for them. I've got pride in all those people who've already gone and got the jab. I've got pride in my own family and my own kids who could see the writing on the wall, who knew that they could not take a chance and wait for this government to deliver Pfizer into our community. And in their 20s, they went and got the AstraZeneca jab. They waited up, they spoke to a good doctor and they went ahead. But they shouldn't be in that position. They wouldn't be in that position 
if this government had actually delivered an effective and timely rollout. It's a disaster. Mr Morrison should be ashamed Senator of himself. Senator O'Neill, your time has expired. Senator Macdonald. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, what a dismal, disappointing afternoon we are having here. Because at Australia's greatest time of need, what do we hear but negative rock throwing? What do we hear but an opposition who is very, very happy to be in a nation that has had the lowest infection rates, the lowest death rates, the most extraordinary financial uh, response to this pandemic of any in the world, who has managed to save lives and save jobs with their programs? And yet now, what we're going to listen to is an opposition who, with the benefit of hindsight, could tell you exactly what was going to happen, who, with the benefit of hindsight and without having any manual, as wasn't provided to any government in the world, are going to tell you exactly what they would have done and, uh, and how the government, without any of the benefits of hindsight and this uh, mythical manual, uh, could have done so much better. But can I tell you what's happened in my state of Queensland? When the Pfizer vaccine started arriving earlier this year, they were so poorly administered by Queensland Health, there were so many that were going out of date, they had to start throwing up tents and hoping people would walk in off the street to commence their vaccinations, despite the federal government providing the vaccines and the ammunition to inform people. I was aware of people who walked in, having seen it on the street, and got their vaccination within 30 minutes. How many of those vaccines were destroyed for going out of date? How many people in Queensland were not encouraged to be vaccinated early? How much vaccine hesitancy was the result of the words of the Queensland government who was only keen in being a roadblock in the way of the federal government's successful rollout. Let me tell you about what happened in Burketown, in the far north of the state, when I arrived and the public health system was there with six people. Six people flew up to vaccinate a community of 300 people. And in the two days they were there, they vaccinated 50. And in that time, uh, they, uh, we have left communities uh, un, uh, have left communities exposed because of the lack of practical administrative uh, processing. We had Queensland Health admin officers in Townsville being vaccinated, but not the doctors and nurses at the hospital. These are the kind of practical implementations that Queensland Health failed on, because. The greatest impediment to vaccinating Queenslanders is our own Labor state government. Queensland Health did not order any AstraZeneca in July, any, and only ordered 1,000 doses in May. Queensland has the second lowest rate of fully vaccinated people at just over 18 per cent and the lowest rate of people who have had just one do dose at under 37 per cent. Uh, it, it is extraordinary that the opposition would continue to lay all this blame at the federal government's feet despite the millions of doses that are being provided to state governments to get into the arms of its population. And of course the latest, the latest thought bubble that's come from Mr Albanese is this cash for jabs. The best incentive that we can be providing to get the vaccination is the fact that it could save your life and the lives of your, of your loved ones. It's not something that people put a price on. Australians know that. And that they know their taxpayer dollars are best spent supporting those who are doing it tough, who have lost their jobs or lost work due to another round of current lockdowns. Instead, Labor is proposing payments to people who have already been vaccinated or have already decided to get their vaccinations. 
Research has highlighted that financial incentives have had little to no impact on vaccination rates, and suggesting that people be paid to get vaccinated will again alter their risk perception on what decision they should be making. It also removes the personal responsibility from Australians to understand what is the right thing to be doing. At some point as a nation, we have to make the decision of what actions we personally are going to take. Senator O'Neill was talking about her pride in this nation, but I can't help but notice if she spent more time picking up the phone and helping people to understand how to book a vaccination, what options they had to go and make that decision for them and for their families, and less time on Facebook reading Lucy Wicks's Facebook page, how much further ahead the people of New South Wales might be. Because I put that to so many people. Have you been able to get the vaccine? And so often the answer is, well, yes. I rang the hospital, but I couldn't get an appointment. I rang my GP and I got one. I went to see my pharmacist and I got one. Many examples of people taking their own personal responsibility to go ahead and take the actions to become vaccinated because they know that that is the right thing to do. Senator Seawitt was raising questions about children over the age of 12 being vaccinated. And from the 9th of August this year, around 220,000 children aged between 12 and 15 who are at a higher risk of illness, if they contract COVID-19, will be able to receive a COVID vaccination. This includes children with a specified medical condition that increases their risk of severe COVID-19, including severe asthma, diabetes, obesity, cardiac and circulatory congenital abnormalities, neurodevelopment disorders, epilepsy, immunocompromised and trisomy 21, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children, all children aged 12 to 15 in remote communities as part of broader community outreach vaccination programs that provide vaccines for all ages over 12. And this provides a review of the Pfizer vaccine for use in children aged 12 to 15 by the Australian Technical Advisory Group on Immunisation. One of the things that Australia has done very well is not rush. We have not rushed decision-making and approvals because Australians are telling us they don't want that to happen. Australians are telling us that they have questions about the vaccination and they want to feel confident. And so this rollout has allowed people to know that for those people uh, who, are, who want the vaccination, that the vaccination is available to them. We cannot put a price on Australian safety, and we know that we have a plan to get back to normal life and a target of getting 70 per cent of eligible Australians vaccinated so lockdowns are less likely, restrictions are easy, easing and many freedoms are returned. This plan is working. Already more than 12 million doses have been given, and that is ramped up to more than a million doses per week. So regardless of what rocks the, the opposition is going to continue to throw, what criticisms they have, what benefit of 2020 hindsight vision they have, what secret manual that apparently they have that nobody else in the world has, in Australia the plan is working. Australians are able to get access to vaccinations. They are able to consult with their doctor and they are able to visit a range of different sites, where it be hospitals, GPs, community pharmacies and other primary care providers. So I beg the opposition not to continue this horrible, negative, anti-Australian, anti-safety messaging, but to stand shoulder to shoulder with the government to stand shoulder to shoulder with the communities of Australia, particularly those regional and rural Australians, and to support 
this incredibly successful vaccination rollout that is speeding up with every day that goes past and is ensuring that Australians will be safe, will continue the extraordinary economic recovery that we are having. Thank you. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to contribute to this important debate. We've known since the start of the pandemic that First Nations people have an increased risk of adverse effects from COVID-19. We've known since the start of the pandemic that we're, we're walking into a crisis. We are no strangers to dealing with deadly infectious diseases to which we have no immunity. We survived disease brought by the colonisers like smallpox, which killed hundreds of thousands of my people. Our people, and communities and organisations mobilised our COVID-19 responses early and effectively. Remote communities organised big return to country reparation efforts to keep people well on country. Our self-determined organisations produced health promotion materials in language to keep our communities safe and healthy. The botched vaccine rollout, and yes, it's botched and it still is botched by Mr Morrison, the so-called Prime Minister, has been marred by inconsistent messaging and inadequate vaccine numbers. Mr Morrison's failure to secure enough vaccines has led to serious and valid concerns about how low rates of immunity are affecting Western Australians, Queensland and South Australia. As I mentioned, our people know how to keep our communities healthy. In Victoria, my home state, Aboriginal health services have helped get 58% of First Nations people vaccinated. This confirms that we've always known self-determination works. When First People are in the driver's seat, we achieve great things. And yet, just last month, the National Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Organisation was excluded from a meeting of the National COVID-19 Vaccine Task Force. So if that's not telling you that First Nations don't matter to the Morrison government, then I don't know what is. First Nations health services need to be included in the conversation. We have solutions and resourced properly. We can keep our communities safe. We can look after one another. We just need the vaccines to be able to do it. The Morrison government has said since the start of this pandemic, that vaccinating First Nations communities was a priority. Well, start acting like we are the priority and get everyone vaccinated and get your plan sorted out to save people's lives. Thank you. Senator Ayres. Uh, thanks, uh, I'm Acting Deputy President. Well, as this parliament meets again, Australia's largest city is in lockdown. Uh, and most of the eastern seaboard has, over the last few weeks, uh, been in lockdown. It's an anxious time for millions of Australians, including millions of Sydney siders, uh, who are either stuck in their homes, where they risk uh, the virus when they travel uh, to the supermarket, or working in essential jobs around the city, uh, where they are uh, doing the right thing for the country and the right thing uh, by Sydney, but facing uh, the constant risk, uh, the escalating risk of the coronavirus pandemic. It is clear to the people of Sydney and it's clear to the people of Australia that the Morrison government's vaccine rollout has been an abject failure. And it's that failure that is the reason that we have the lockdown. But plenty of people on the other side of the Senate have criticised the state governments for the lockdowns, but the lockdowns are a necessary public health response when the, vaccine, when the vaccination rate is so low. Without vaccination, there is no other measure that's available um, other, than, uh, other than the lockdowns. This is Scott Morrison's lockdown. It was his hubris, his utter failure of leadership that has created this crisis. All of his press conferences, 
look like a list of things that he should have done in 2020. Only this Prime Minister would so abjectly shrink from the work required to solve this national crisis. Because it, it, for him, it requires three things. It requires grasping complexity. It requires casting aside ideology in favour of pragmatic solutions. And it requires being honest with the Australian people in the national interest. No wonder he is so uniquely unsuited to this work. Just when we needed it most, we have a Prime Minister who is utterly incapable of doing his job. Nowhere was this failure more apparent than his consistent refusal to condemn members of his own backbench for undermining public health measures. The soon-to-be former member for Dawson endorsed the selfish, dangerous, anti-lockdown protests in Sydney and Melbourne on his social media pages and hosted his own protest in Mackay. He claimed that the coronavirus is no more dangerous than the flu and it only kills the elderly. He even went so far as to tell the small crowd, at some point in this fight, civil disobedience is going to have to be done. We're going to have to prepare for that at some stage. Self-indulgent, extreme narcissism. And yet, neither the Prime Minister nor the Deputy Prime Minister have taken a single step to condemn him. Nor did they condemn Senator Rennick when he attacked public health measures, saying, you can't protect the weak by destroying the strong. Senator Canavan also joined in. He told ABC, I don't think these lockdowns are the right response. They're causing untold damage to people's mental health, to their business, their employment situations, their, marriage, their marriages. Not content at pretending to be a coal miner, now he's an epidemiologist. He's a one-man careers fair. He's had more imaginary more imaginary careers than Paul Hogan had real ones. This week, or last week, I think, Senator Canavan made the bizarre decision to appear on Steve Bannon's podcast, which has been furiously pumping out vaccine and COVID misinformation to the far-right internet, probably sourced uh, from, uh, from Russia somewhere, but damaging to our democracy and damaging to the public health effort. Senator Canavan and Mr Christensen and Senator Rennick they show everything that's wrong with the modern National Party, more concerned with prosecuting culture wars than representing the people who they should be representing. The saddest part of Senator Canavan's uh, appearance was when, at the end of his uh, podcast, I couldn't bear to watch it, uh, on his way out of talking about his big role in the international resistance to communism and whatever other garbage it was he was going through, Given the opportunity, he spelled out his Twitter account and asked people to follow him. He literally spelled it out. I mean, for goodness sake, instead of protecting the health and livelihoods of regional Australia, he's begging for followers on far-right podcasts. We need a serious effort from this Prime Minister. We need serious accountability. We need serious answers. Australians have done their job. Victorians have done their job. New South Wales people have done Senator their job. Senator Ayres, your time Prime Minister has duty. expired. Senator Bain. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. And I'd like to thank Senator O'Neill for, for this MPI. I always love it when Labor get their MPIs up in the ballot. It's like they're delivering us a Dorothy Dixer every single time. And this is just another example. What rot in this MPI? How she could possibly write that down is, is beyond anyone. But let's have a look at why. The vaccine rollout is continuing to gain momentum. More than 12 million doses have been administered, and we're now hitting more than a million doses administered each week. If you look at the starting point from when we started rolling out this vaccine 160 days ago, Australia is actually ranked around 14th from that time of thing. Now, why was it late? Because we built in that safety factor of seeing how it affected other countries. And why could we do that? Because we didn't have COVID at the time. So we built in extra, safe, extra safety measures. Now we're rolling it out and we have 80% of over 70s had their first jab. We've had 65% of over 50 year olds um, have had their first. And if we look at the whole eligible population, 
40 per cent have had their first and 19 have had their second. And the rollout continues apace, and it will continue to do so. Now, as the Prime Minister had said, Madam Acting Deputy President, there have been a number of setbacks in the vaccine program, and as a government we've taken responsibility for this. No one could have foreseen the challenges that AstraZeneca has brought, but uh, it has saved countless lives nonetheless. The UQ vaccine fell out. It was a very good candidate, but had positive, false positives, so we had to take that out of the list. Now we have other vaccines, and the amount of vaccines is growing every week. And the government has taken responsibility, as I said, for, for th these steps, but we also take responsibility for a number of other things. And as some of my, uh, my colleagues previously have said, we have the second lowest death rate in the OECD. We have protected jobs of over three million Australians on JobKeeper and have got more people back into work than were out of work before COVID hit. Now, all these facts are lost on those on the other side. They, they don't seem to grasp what's important to Australians, and that is protecting their lives and protecting their livelihoods. Currently, we have two vaccines on offer that we know are safe and provide effective protection against COVID-19 and its subsequent variants. To ensure Australians are protected against the Delta variant, we all have a responsibility to promote the vaccines and reduce vaccine hesitancy. What doesn't help in delivering a speedy and effective rollout is when Labor's candidate in the seat of Higgins spreads mistrust around the AstraZeneca vaccine and promotes vaccine hesitancy even further. What doesn't help the rollout is when the Queensland Labor government's chief health officer continues to criticise the AstraZeneca vaccine when we know it is safe. It has been approved for use by the TGA, and we know it will help keep Australians safe. You only need to look at the UK's rollout. They've, their effective uh, population, of, uh, the effective rate of their population vaccinated is 57 per cent, and their death rates have dropped from over 1,000 a day to uh, the last number I saw was 24 a day. So the AstraZeneca is very effective in protecting life. So what we need to do is have the Labor Party stop doing everything possible to undermine the rollout and promoting vaccine hesitancy. You know, even just today, the leader of the uh, opposition party, Mr Albanese, explicitly refuses to uh, in endorse the AstraZeneca vaccine. His thought bubble of $300 a day, now what's that going to do in people's minds and make them going to think, oh, I'll just wait a while until I get uh, you know, my vaccine because, yeah, I'll get 300 bu bucks if I wait. We want people to go and get vaccinated now. So these little thought bubbles that wander out from those opposite need to stop. They need to get behind our vaccine <coughs> rollout. They need to roll up their sleeves and do the work that parliamentarians should. So, in answer to those questions, is that they just don't care. They're very happy to play politics with the, uh, the vaccine rollout. And I think Australians Senator are seen Bain, through their political time aims. Senator has expired. Senator Stilljohn. Are you on mute, Senator Stilljohn? Is this I'm sorry, we're not able to hear you, Senator Steele John. Is there an issue that Hansard can help us with? So um oh. can you hear me, Senator Seaward? I can hear you, Senator Seawood. Okay, so we can hear online. We can hear Senator Steele, John, if that helps the technicians. We'll just wait for a moment if I can get some indication whether that does help.
are we able to fix this issue? We'll just wait for, for a few more seconds to see if the technicians can fix this issue. But otherwise, we will have to uh, move on to the next agenda item. I'm sorry, Senator Still John. I think we'll have to move on. I'm not getting any indication from the technicians that they are able to correct the issue. Senator, Senator Hanson Young. Can, can someone turn Senator Hanson Young's mic on, please? Continue. Thank you. Uh, given we can't hear Senator or see Senator Steele John um, here in the chamber, I think um, it's only right that uh, we we now do move on. But just to be clear, uh, we've already had a number of Green senators speak to this topic, and I. Uh, know full well that Senator Stilljohn would have been uh, highly critical of the government's rollout of the vaccine uh, to date, critical of their lack of support to people, and I'm sure in his three minutes that he was going to put uh, the case very eloquently that uh, we need to do better to keep Australians safe. Thank you, uh, Senator Hanson Young, and I apologise to Senator Stilljohn. The time for the discussion has expired and we'll now move on to proceed to the consideration of documents. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you. I, um, I just want to uh, I give uh, Senator Seawood an opportunity to uh, speak to number 15. Okay. So we're not at that uh, document yet, uh, Senator Hanson Young, but we would like to with um, with leave of sorry, Senator Hanson Young that um, uh, there is a request to seek leave to allow Senator Steele John to speak. Uh, ha however, I haven't had a response from him as yet, so I don't he's know. On, he's appeared okay, on great. the screen. Thank you, Senator Hanson Young. So, with leave of the Senate, we would like to go back to the MPI and um, for the last contribution by Senator Steele John. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Steelejohn. Senator Steelejohn. I'm. Uh, it doesn't look like the um, issue has been resolved. And I have. Do we have any indication from Hansard, the technicians, whether they are able to resolve the issue quickly? I'm sorry, Senator Steele John. I think um, maybe this time the. Um, it's being seen and not heard. Oh. Was that? No. Okay. So uh, I'm sorry, we will have to um, definitely say that the time for the discussion has expired and proceed back to documents. Um, Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. My uh, understanding is Senator, Senator Stilljohn is now good to go, so I ask um, by leave whether he would be able to make his uh, multiply delayed three-minute contribution okay. on the matter of public importance. Okay. Uh, thank you, Senator McKim. Is leave granted to return to um, the MPI to hear Senator Steelejohn's contribution? Leave is granted. Senator Steelejohn. Thank you, Acting President. Uh, there is a lot of talk in this place and in the media about what it will take to change the way that we manage COVID-19 in the community, to open up. And I've got to say right now, I am furious. Young people are at risk. Disabled people are at risk. 
all because the Morrison government has failed, failed and failed again. This is not good enough. Only a fraction of disabled people are currently vaccinated. It is heartbreaking, absolutely heartbreaking, hearing of COVID-19 cases making their way into group homes with individuals who are not fully vaccinated, and even for those who are in the front of the queue for the vaccine, there is the struggle to find somewhere accessible uh, where it can be administered. We as disabled feeling, people are feeling scared. We are feeling isolated. We are terrified that as corporations push to open up our country, we are the ones who will be left behind to die. It is outrageous that young people do not have a time frame to receive a vaccination. This slow, delayed rollout is causing longer and longer disruptions to our lives. We do not have access to the mental health supports that we need. All the while, house prices go up and the climate crisis continues to loom over our generation. This government's failures are stealing some of the best moments of our youth while at the same time their failures in relation to climate change steal our future. Well, the Greens will not risk the lives of young people, of disabled people, of the immunocompromised. As we move to change our response to the pandemic, we will ensure that the voices of at-risk community members are centred and that their well-being, their safety, is and continues always to be at the centre of everything we do. I thank the Chamber for its time. Thank you, Senator Steele-John. We'll now go back to documents.